Okay, so this question is about moments, and for the first part of the um, question, they're asking us to find, uh, su suggest what instrument could be used to measure the distances to the uh, on the clamp stand. Um, so you can see from the diagram, the smallest interval is going to be that you need to measure is 15 centimeters, and from the table that you can see, we, we need to go up to 90 centimeters. So what's going to be the best thing to measure that? A meter ruler. Nothing fancy, just a meter ruler. Okay, next part of the question, uh, we need to kind of zoom in so that we can see this uh, Newton meter clearly. And you can see, look, there's three Newtons, there's four Newtons, so that's going to be 3.5 Newtons. So that's going to be 3.6 Newtons right there. Okay. So the missing force is 3.6 Newtons, and we can add that into the table above as well. Give a reason why the Newton meter is unsuitable for measuring forces of uh, where distances of less than 15 centimeters. Well, if you look at the pattern of the results in the table, you can see that if we went to distances, you, look, you can see how the pattern is there, that these, these are descending forces. Okay, so that means at distances of uh, less than 15 centimetres, that the forces are going to be greater than 10 newtons. And if you look at our newton meter, it can only measure up to 10 newtons. So that's why it's not suitable. Okay, because the maximum scale is 10 newtons, right? The um, student's result on the grid. Okay, three marks for this. Okay, uh, let's choose a sensible scale. Okay. Hold on, let me just, uh, so that I don't have to keep flicking backwards and forwards to this. I'm just going to take a photo of those results. Okay. Um, and then when I'm plotting, I want to make sure that I'm kind of maximizing the, uh, the paper here. You can see that um, the distance is the uh, thing that I've varied in the experiment. Okay. And it, it's most conventional. We don't always do it, but 90% of the time we would put the independent variable on the x-axis. Okay, so I can go ahead and label this up. And they've given me a nice straightforward scale to use here. Okay, um, that goes up in equal steps. Okay, if you chose um, that one of these large squares was equal to 10, then you, you wouldn't be able to fit it on the graph paper. If you chose that one of these uh, large squares was equal to 20, then that would work fine because you're still filling up more than half the graph paper. Okay. Um, and then I know that on the y axis, oh, I've forgotten something, haven't I? That's right. I need to uh, say that this is the distance and that's in centimeters. So important that I'm labeling up my axes as I go. Okay. And again, they've, you know, they've tried to help you out with the scale here. The maximum value that you need is 10. Okay, and you can see just, yeah, that we're going up in equal steps of two newtons there, right? Um, when we're plotting, we need, oh, sorry. Oh, I nearly lost it there, didn't I? Okay, but of course, this is the force in newtons, right? Okay, so I've got a sensible scale, okay, that fills at least half the paper. Okay, it's going up in equal increments Okay, that one's not so clear, is it? It's going up in equal increments. Okay, so all looking good. So now I can start the plotting. Okay, there's a point there. And you need to be able to plot to the nearest half a small square. So there's five, so 5.6 is going to be just there. Obviously, it's a bit easier to do it with a nice sharp pencil than trying to do it on a computer screen, but I will do my best for you. So there's three, so there's 3.6 right there. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just going to put some crosses so that I've identified exactly where where my points are. Uh, and again, there's two, so that's going to be 2.2 just there. And the final one is 1.8, so there's one, so there's 1.8 just there. Oh, I must have missed, oh, I missed a point out of my, silly me. Just in the middle of making a video, um, but no, I don't think. Just see the drawing it's gone down, there's no flashing lights anyway, but you've seen the system's down, right? Yeah, so I wouldn't trust it, yeah. All right. 
Okay, thanks. All right, back to the video. Sorry, I missed a point out here somewhere on my left. So what was that one? 5.6, 3.6, 2.6. Ah, oh, that was my mistake. See, I'm glad I checked it. Glad Mr. Tennant interrupted me for a moment there. Okay, and 2.2 is there. There we go. Okay. Um, and then, of course, uh, it, I mean, they're giving you a hint. They're telling you it's a curve. So you want a nice smooth curve through all of the points like that. Whoops, just slipped off a little bit at the end. Of course, if I was doing that in pencil, that's no problem, right? So you should definitely be plotting your graph in pencil and using a ruler. Right, all of that to get to this bit, the student concludes that the moment required to tilt the clamp stand does not change when the distance is varied. Use the data from the table or the graph to evaluate the student's conclusion. Moment. Right, so what's the formula for moment again? Moment is force times by perpendicular distance from the pivot. Okay, so that's really the first thing that we need to do. We need to work out the moments for each of these things, right? Okay, so if you do the formula on the top one, you get 1.50. Okay, so like, you know, I can literally make another column in the table here. I'm going to call this moment. And I'm going to work it out in Newton meters, which is the correct units for mo moments. Okay, so 1.5 Newton meters, 1.68 Newton meters, 1.62 Newton meters, 1.56 Newton meters, 1.65 Newton meters, okay, and 1.62 Newton meters. Okay, um, and now, well, I mean, take a look at those results. Do they look the same to you? Well, they're not identical, are they? Okay, so you could put together a strong argument to say that they're not all the same. Therefore, the student's conclusion is incorrect. Okay, um, but then, you know, think about the errors and, and uncertainties associated with this, with this experiment. You know, if they'd measured 30, you know, if I hadn't measured that perfectly correctly, you know, I mean, they're needing to measure to the middle of this elastic band. Yeah, so if they hadn't measured that absolutely perfectly, if they hadn't measured this absolutely perfectly, so, you know, is that variation in results within experimental error? I mean, they're all quite similar, aren't they? They're not the same, but they are similar. So interestingly, for this part of the question, you don't get a mark for saying whether the student's conclusion is right or wrong. Okay, because you can make a strong argument for the student's conclusion being correct, and you can also make a strong argument for the, conclusion, uh, the student's conclusion being incorrect. The important thing is that you've worked out at least a couple of these moments, that you've compared them, and then you've come to a sensible conclusion. All right? And that, I believe, is the end of that question.